Okay, good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Tuesday of the fourth week in Lent. Thank you for joining me this evening. Our scriptures for this evening, our psalm is number 25. Our Old Testament lesson is from Jeremiah 17. And our New Testament lesson, we will finish Romans chapter 7. Before we dive in, I, I would like us to pray together that God would help us to keep our focus on him and his word. Please pray with me. Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us as we come into your presence from cold hearts and wandering thoughts, that with steady minds and burning zeal we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly, hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm is number 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be humiliated, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Let the treacherous be disappointed in their schemes. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, 
for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Gracious and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in his way. He guides the humble in doing right and teaches his way to the lowly. All the paths of the Lord are love and faithfulness to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, forgive my sin, for it is great. Who are they who fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They shall dwell in prosperity, and their offspring shall inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him, and will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever looking to the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and have pity on me, for I am left alone and in misery. The sorrows of my heart have increased. Bring me out of my troubles. Look upon my adversity and misery and forgive me all my sin. Look upon my enemies, for they are many and they bear a violent hatred against me. Protect my life and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I have trusted in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for my hope has been in you. Deliver Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Let us pray. Lord our God, you show us your ways of compassion and love, and you spare sinners. Remember not our sins. Relieve our misery. Satisfy the longing of your people. And fulfill all our hopes for eternal peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so... Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to skip the first part of this chapter and we'll pick up at verse 19, which is titled, this section rather, is titled, Keep the Sabbath Holy. Thus said the Lord God to me, Go and stand in the people's gate, by which the kings of Judah enter, and by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take care for the sake of your lives, and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day, or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath, or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your fathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, that they might not hear and receive instruction. But if you listen to me, declares the Lord, and bring in no burden by the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but keep the Sabbath day holy, and do not work on it. Then there shall enter by the gates of this city kings and princes, who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their officials, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall be inhabited forever, and people shall come from the cities of Judah and the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the Shephelah, from the hill country, and from the Negeb, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and frankincense, and bringing thank offerings to the house of the Lord. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy, and not to bear a burden and enter by the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then... I will kindle a fire in its gates, 
and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and shall not be quenched. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson is from Romans chapter 7, and we pick up where we left off yesterday, beginning at verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, and that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging, against, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Bishop Dan and Dean Nathan, for all of our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the Church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, 
that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. To you, O Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so Jeremiah, this one is all about the Sabbath, this section anyway. So Jeremiah is first told to confront the people at the gates of the city, right? Um, he wants to catch them where they would enter and leave the city. Now, when he says the people's gate... Right, go and stand in the people's gate. That's the very first verse we heard. By which kings of Judah enter and by which they go out. Well, if it's the people's gate, it's probably not just for the royalty. It's probably for the kings and everybody else. Okay. Um, okay. So it says, go there and tell everyone. Do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day. So this likely consisted of articles to be offered or uh, for sale by greedy merchants. In other words, don't carry anything into the city on the Sabbath day to barter, to sell, or to trade. That is counter to the guidance for the Sabbath. So... But keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your fathers. The keeping of this commandment served as a touchstone for obedience. So, when we come to worship on Sunday, yes, it's about praising God and worshiping God and receiving the gift of grace and forgiveness, whether that's in the Word or in the sacrament of the altar. It's about that. 
But even before that, it's about submitting to God's will. It's about humbling ourselves and saying that God's will for us to come together in his house, in worship, is more important than our own. It is more important for us to give up Sunday morning to worship God than it is to do what other things we might have planned. It is an act of obedience and submission to God's will to come to church. Martin Chemnitz was another one of Martin Luther's uh, inner circle. And he wrote this. The general principle here is, do not perform works which hinder the ministry or stubbornly carry on needless labor. For if we are to support the practice of public worship, then we must give up those activities which hinder this worship. Hmm. Okay. But your fathers did not listen or inclined their ear, but stiffened their neck that they might not hear and receive instruction. Right? Stiffened their neck. Hmm. But if you listen to me, <laughs> how much of the story of the Old Testament, really, that's what God's saying. If you just listen to me, everything will be better than what it is now. If you just listen to me. But if you listen to me, declares the Lord, and bring in no burden by the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but keep the Sabbath day holy and do no work on it. This is what I've told you. This is my commandment. Listen to me. Then there shall enter by the gates of this city kings and princes who sit on the thrones, I'm sorry, who sit on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their officials. Okay, so what is all this? All right. This is um, a sign of prosperity that the people are not conquered but they are their own people ruling themselves in their particular tribes, right? And they can come and go in Jerusalem as they see fit. And people shall come from the cities of, Jer of Judah and the places around Jerusalem, the land of Benjamin, from the Shephelah, from the hill country, from the Negev, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and frankincense. These are, these are signs of plenty, that things are going well, that that um, people can share their, their wealth, their riches. They're going to bring them, they can bring them to Jerusalem and offer them to God and life will be good. But if you don't, if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy, not bear burden and enter by the gates on the Sabbath, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and shall not be quenched. I'm going to burn it all down and you won't be able to put the fire out. All right, here's the summary here. The Sabbath was a day of rest and worship under Mosaic law. You can read about this in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. God set this day aside as a blessing for his people by continuing commerce on the Sabbath just as on any other day. God's people broke the covenant and turned their backs on him. Rest and worship are essential for the spiritual health and welfare of God's people. The gospel of Jesus Christ draws us together in public worship so that we might rejoice in our salvation and return to our callings with renewed confidence. So if rest and worship are essential for the spiritual health and welfare of God's people, is it any wonder that as we have opened up stores on Sunday and made Sunday feel like any other business day, pretty much. There are very few stores that are not open on Sunday now, at least for some amount of time. And yet our country is in huge turmoil. Violence is at what seems like an all-time high. Chaos is rampant. Any chance those two things are connected? Hmm. All right. Romans, 
and I would remind you that although uh, we, we started on verse 13, the beginning of this section a few verses before is titled The Law and Sin. And yesterday when we finished with this, it said, <laughs> I wouldn't have known sin if it weren't for the law. So does that mean that the law is bad? No, the law is good. Well, did that, and that's where we pick up. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. Heck no. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. All right, let's break this down. God's law is intended for our good and sin is not inconsequential. We are not to excuse our sins. We are completely sinful. Okay? We can't pretend that our sins are not sin. For we know that the law is spiritual. All right. That means it is of divine origin. But I'm in the flesh, part of the fallen world. Okay. Now, this is where Paul does his own lament. For I do not understand my own actions. I don't understand myself, is what he's saying. I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. And that is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Okay? I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to power through this part, and then we'll, then we'll break it down. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. We just said we are sinful. For I have the desire to do what is right. I want to, but not the ability to carry it out. I want it to do right, but I can't seem to do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing continually. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So he repeated that same phrase twice. Now, Here's how the study Bible breaks this down. As a Christian, Paul struggles with his sinful nature. He has sinful desires, but he knows that they are wrong. He tries to avoid sin, but inevitably fails. Even as a Christian, he cannot overcome sin by his efforts. So here's Luther's response to that. Both expressions are true. That he himself does it, and he himself does not do it. He's like a horseman. When his horses do not trot the way he wants them to, it is he himself, and yet not he himself, who makes the horse run in such and such a way. For the horse is not without him, and he is not without the horse. But because a carnal man, a carnal man certainly consents to the law of his members, he certainly himself does what sin does. So he is committing these sins, even if it's not his, um, his, his self that wants to be righteous that is committing these sins. It's his sinful nature. Um, boy, this is hard to explain. Um, but he's, he can't just say, well, somebody else did it because it's my sinful nature and that's not really me. That doesn't absolve him of it. Okay. But it does, exp his sinful nature and him not being able to overcome that does explain why he does it. It's still, it's still him, but not really. Hmm. That's not a very good explanation. I apologize. Let's keep going. I hope that Paul can bring this back together. All right, so I find it to be a law, in other words, a regular occurrence. Whenever Paul attempts good, he still sins. I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Okay? In other words, this happens constantly. For I delight in the law of God. Although our fallen nature rebels, the new nature 
because of Christ, rejoices in God's truth. In my inner being, I rejoice, I delight in the law of God, excuse me, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So here's our members again. The inner being that delights in God's word is the law of my mind. The law of sin is the power or control of sin over us. Wretched man that I am. Paul detests this about himself and his continued sinfulness. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This enslaving sin deserves death, has earned death. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind. All right, there's a little bit longer explanation here. Let me see how much of this we can get through. We are fallen sinners who are bound to sin. We confess that every week. Yet as God's new creation, which we are in baptism, we want to serve and obey him. We want to. Paul neither ignores his sinfulness nor gives up. He relies on Christ alone. All right, here's Luther again. The old man is infected with all vices and has by nature nothing good in him, as he says in verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, when we have come into Christ's kingdom, these things must daily decrease. The longer we live, the more we become gentle, patient, meek, and ever turn away from unbelief, greed, hatred, envy, and arrogance. That's from the large catechism, by the way. That is, doesn't that sound like what we've been talking about? About being sanctified, becoming more holy? The longer we do this, the longer we live, the more we become the way God wants us to be. Okay, here's the summary of this part. Our struggle with sin is not a past event. It is a present reality. We know God's will, and we desire to serve him, but we can't overcome sin on our own. Even if we try, we fail. We cry out, who will deliver me from this body of death? There's only one answer. Thanks be to God, through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord, Jesus rescues us. Though we sin daily, continues to forgive and restore us. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ. So there's there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Okay. Um, remember the law points out our sin and tells us that we've sinned. And that's the law is a good thing. For for the law to tell me that, that was a sin and you need to repent of it, you need to not do it again, and, you need, and then you will be forgiven. And, and we know, God tells us, we will be forgiven when we repent. There are some who would have us believe that certain things aren't sin. They aren't sin at all. Well, that if the Bible calls it a sin, it's a sin. Now, some things the Bible has... Yeah, Jesus took care of the food laws. Those are no longer valid. Jesus eliminated those, basically. You, you, you have to look to the Bible for those explanations. Um, to be forgiven does not mean we can keep on sinning. We talked about that just a few days ago. Yeah. So sh are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Heck no. By no means. Okay. We have to know God's word so that we know what sin is. We'll find his law in here and he will teach us his ways in his word. And as we do that, we will grow closer and closer to becoming the kind of, of child of God that God created us to be. 
All right, that's I'm over my time. I apologize. That's a good place to stop anyway. Let's pray about this, shall we? Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom which comes down from heaven that your word may not be bound but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people that in steadfast faith we may serve you and in the confession of your name may abide to the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, that concludes our Vespers for this evening. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you for spending this time in the Word. Thank you for giving back to God some of the day He's given to you. Uh, please keep your prayers up, and I hope you will continue to join me. Um, we're going to keep doing this. It's I find it very refreshing and helpful, and I hope you do too. So thank you. And until we can be together again, may God bless and keep you. <laughs>